So I'm Michelle, and then this is Doug says thank you so much for attending our session today. We're really excited to be here and to provide you with massive information. We're hoping it's new information. Actually, we're hoping it's not new information. We're hoping that you might have some uh, background in this area. What uh, Dex and I want to preempt our presentation with is just the statement that we are not experts in driver education or driver safety. That's not what we're here uh, to talk about. We're here to talk about an approach to evaluating the curriculum, an approach to uh, understanding that uh, different learning abilities, learning styles, how the brain is put together, uh, leads us to the necessity to look at how we are instructing drivers, how we are teaching drivers, because uh, we all learn in a different way. So we're not going to tell you exactly what we need to be doing in order to um, uh, make those changes, but some of the questions that you need to be asking and how you need to be looking at that, because how we learn does um, change how we are going to demonstrate our knowledge. So, the kind of information. Um, I'll give you a little bit about an idea here of what we're going to be talking about. If I can find my show you an overview to the end once it gets in. This is using a program called Inspiration. It's one of my favorite uh, programs when I'm planning a session, uh, when I'm teaching, and one of my uh, contracts is with the University of Alberta Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry. So I help uh, medical students prepare for their um, medical exams and uh, medical residents prepare for their royal college exams. And we use this program a lot in order to help them understand the relationship between ideas and how ideas are connected. Because as you're going to learn here, ideas need to be connected in order to be understood. So today, what we're going to be talking about, the, and the topic that's very talky, is rethinking driver education. I'm going to start off by talking about memory and recall, how it works, how the brain functions in a very general way. And then we're going to move into learner diversity. What does that tell us about learner diversity? and then the principles of universal design for learning. And under those principles for universal design for learning are accommodation versus UGL, or universal design for learning, what the difference is between those two, and how, uh, how we represent, how we express, and how um, we can engage learners um, are some of the principles of universal design that we're going to talk about getting you to be looking at curriculum or program design in terms of UGL. So if anybody's interested in this, um, software you can have a look it's called inspiration and that website at the bottom is where you can find it if you do a lot of uh, presentations and you need planning if you're like me information doesn't come out of your head in a logical linear order all the time sometimes it comes out in a little bit of a random way and this helps us go through and it can come out in a random way and, and put it into a more sequential manner so it is a universal design for learning tool that i thought i would show you So traditionally, the um, traffic safety has come to sort of two approaches. One is um, reducing results of dangerous behavior, so basically um, attacking the environment, putting safety issues in like seat belts and airbags and speed limits and well designed to sort of uh, minimize the impact when there are collisions. And the other approach has been to control human behavior, which is much more challenging. So how do we make um, humans reduce their dangerous behavior on the road. And part of that, beginning, is improving driving skill and enhancing the knowledge base. Well, how do we enhance the knowledge base? Well, first we have to learn how, how we learn and how our brain works when we take information in. So Michelle's going to do um, a quick sort of summary of that before we go on. Right. So, how's that sound? Does it sound a bit loud? Yeah, maybe we can get a little bit of a think back here. I'm going to draw in order to illustrate this. So I have presented workshops actually across Canada because recently I was in Southern Ireland presenting to a national conference there in the area of learning, um, uh, remembering, retaining, applying information as well as in the area of those two things that are, are, are hugely important to me. Um, and uh, when I was trying to think of how do I present information on memory, because it's not the most it's really important, but it's not the most exciting information in the world. So I have to think of a way to make it very meaningful. So what this is, is I, um, after looking at theories of memory, 
say, how can we put this into a way that makes sense? So this is my way of illustrating the concept of the three different kinds of memory and how, how we take information in, in our brain. So in order to do this, I'm going to have to draw a diagram. Uh, I'm going to use Lynn as my model here, my only moderator, Lynn. So Lynn, I'm going to draw your head, OK? So I think I've got sort of the general just of it. down view of Lynn's head. So a bird's eye view, looking down. And so when I look down at the bird of Lynn's head, I can see that she's got two eyes. There we are. Now Lynn, they're not quite as giddy as that. They don't really look like that, but that helps us illustrate that. And when we look down, we can also see that Lynn has a nose. Now we can't actually see her mouth, but I can illustrate her, her, her mouth. Zip the cord down. And then Lynn has ears. And Lynn also has arms. Now, you can see why I did my master's degree in education. <laughs> so this is the top down view. Now, why did I draw that? It's important because there are basically three stages of memory based on this model. The first stage of memory is sensory memory. So we can take in information through our senses, and so I've tried to illustrate those five senses. So the five senses being, obviously, sense of sight, vision. We've got sense of smell, sense of taste. We have sense of hearing, and then we have kinesthetic. So the arms are to represent the kinesthetic, the tactile kind of learning. Those are our five senses. It's the only five ways we can get information into our brain. Those are the five standard ways to get information into our brain. So sensory memory, through sensory memory, we have an incredible capacity to take in information through our five senses. In terms of memory, it is huge in its capacity, but what we know about its duration is it's extremely gradually, as a matter of fact, a fraction of a second. So it can take all this information in, but it's very brief. And it doesn't matter if you have access to all this information if you don't do anything with it. So where it moves after sensory memory is to the next stage of memory, which is a really critical component. And actually, it's probably, um, in, in, in the work that I do, it's probably one of the most critical components that we have in, in terms of learning. And I'm going to draw it. It actually physically is not necessarily here. It's not as specific as that. But we're going to pretend as if it's all located here. And that memory is working memory. So information then goes from this very broad sensory memory into a more specific working memory. As a matter of fact, working memory only holds anywhere between five and nine pieces of information. So the standard telephone number of how many digits or how many numbers you have, seven numbers long. The average working memory of an adult is seven, seven pieces of information. As a matter of fact, I can test it right now. Do you want me to test your working memory capacities? Okay, what time is it in the day? Oh, this is Sunday, so it's maybe a little bit lower on Sunday when you've been working a busy week. Um, I'll just really quickly just repeat after me. Two, five, seven. Now. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you another string. Just wait and then repeat after me. Okay? Six, one, nine, eight, four, two, three, six, one. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. What are you actually most likely to remember? The beginning, and sometimes the end, and what we hear in the middle. So working memory is, is limited in how many pieces of information you can hold at any one time. And its duration is actually very limited as well. It's two to five seconds. So if you have two to five seconds to do something with that information, in order to move to the next level of storage in your brain, which we're going to picture back here, and that is long-term memory. And of course, that's pretty important to everything that we do. We've got to retain information within our long-term memory. But within 
our memory, there are within our long-term memory, there are also some different stages. And this, you know, sounds like it's getting kind of drawn up here, but absolutely critical when we're talking about driver education. To understand working memory and to understand the stages of memory. So one of those stages I call here, and again, it's not physically located here, but it seems to me to make some sense, and that's your automatic memory. And your automatic memory is that kind of information that you know instantly. Or as people say, right off the top of your head, right off there, I know it off the top of my head, that's in your automatic memory. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Then we have a stage that's slightly further back here in the next zone. And I call that the retrieval zone. The retrieval zone is the zone where you can get the information when you need it, but it's not going to be instant. A little bit different than the automatic zone. So it might take you a few seconds, maybe two or three, maybe as much as, as 10 seconds in order to access that information, maybe slightly longer than that. And then we have another zone in the brain, and for lack of better terminology and to keep it simple, I just call it the lost zone. And that's information that you probably heard sometime in your life. You might have even engaged in some activity in order to learn it but you can't find it. You go to look for that information and you can't find it. And you're reliant often on a cue, but not something, a cue that you've made yourself, but often somebody else giving you an answer or an idea. I remember one time I was doing a crossword puzzle the night before, and I could not think of, of the name uh, of a word, and it was really bothering me. And then I was driving to work in the morning, and there was a song that was played on the radio that was associated with that word I was looking for, and there popped the word. You know, 12 and a half hours after I needed it. So not really helpful at the time. What I want to do is I want to show you a um, demonstration of some different kinds of information. So I'm going to ask, can I just use you for a demo? And it's not embarrassing or in intimidating at all. Mm -hmm. Would you mind just coming to the front for a second? What's your name? Cora. Cora. Hi, Cora. So Cora is just going to turn around and look at, no, the other way. You're going to look at that. So I'm just going to move back here. Sorry, camera person, but you can just go ahead. So Cora, I'm just going to ask Cora a couple of very simple questions and we're going to see what Cora does. So you guys watch Cora. Sorry, Cora. <laughs> Cora, uh, what's your birthday? June 3rd. June 3rd. Okay, I'm going to give you the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. You don't need to. Um, Cora, are you married? Yes. Okay. And Jason, do you want to marry? No. Okay. Your husband's birthday is June 3rd. Okay. And your mother's birthday is December 20th. Very good. Okay, come have a seat for a minute. That was it, all of us? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's interesting because Cora actually did something different than a lot of individuals will do. So when I asked her for birthday, what did you notice? She, she stopped and she looked up, which is actually quite unusual because most people, when you ask their own birthday, they don't look up. Um, why, why did you think Cora looked up? She was trying to determine whether she should be really <laughs> <laughs> And so I, when, as soon as she looked up, I thought, well, what is she looking up to do? And you were looking up to make a decision. <laughs> Wait a second, do I need to disclose that? No, she probably doesn't really want to know that. So what people will, so what I say then is birthdays, their own birthdays, are typically within the automatic zone of the brain. They're in the automatic zone of the brain. How does it get there? Okay, repetition is one element. So, in the automatic, if we repeat or if we practice information, it helps it get into the automatic zone. But there's another element at least as important and perhaps more important. It's connected, it's connected information, or what I like to say is it's meaningful. What is meaningful and important to us is more likely to go into the automatic zone. And that is so important because we've seen things where we repeated, 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 and it's not going in there. And why not? Because it didn't matter. It wasn't meaningful. So how do we know information get into the automatic zone? We make it more meaningful and we practice at the same time. Now, when I asked Cora about her spouse's birthday and her mother's birthday, then she did the look up thing. And I'm going to suggest that perhaps she was looking up because it wasn't as automatic. You did very well, though. Now, sometimes I can be a little mean and I will pick a man from the audience, and the chances go up 
actually that they don't know the answer at all. Um, so uh, sometimes that can be very good. Um, but that would be then we would say it's maybe in the retrieval zone. Now, maybe at this point, pretty darn close to the automatic. Maybe we would even say that automatic because we said it so quickly. But information that gets less meaningful to traffic like will be a little bit further back. Now, I'm going to ask you, uh, how does anybody in this audience have any idea when Ward Keith's birthday is? No? No? Why not? Because it's the <laughs> Somebody had an idea? I think it's June 23rd. June 23rd? <laughs> Actually, it's not, because I did ask them. Oh, okay. Yeah? You're in the right half of the year, though. Um, now, you don't know it because you haven't been told it. Now, let's say that last year at uh, the same event, you did hear that. You heard it once. Now, you might like the guy. Seems like a pretty good guy to me. But it wouldn't be repeated. And it might not be as, as meaningful or as important as he might be. His birthday wouldn't be that meaningful. So that information, even had you heard it, would be back here in the law zone. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to play, I'm going to do a magic trick. I'm going to take the information from my head and magically throw it into your head. It's going to be so cool. Watch this. His birthday is actually May the 4th. It was on Friday. So, let's just hear. When is Ward King's birthday? Wasn't that cool? I took it from my head and threw it into yours. Now, where is that information? So it would be sitting right here. It's in the retrieval zone. It's not taking very long. I wouldn't say it's in the automatic zone because we haven't had enough time to put it in there. Now, how would we get it in there if you practiced it and practiced it? It was really important to hear you could put it in the automatic zone. If, if you really want to get on its good side, put it into your uh, day timer right now or into your electronic calendar, and then you can put it as a yearly reminder, and then you can get that all the time. But here's the thing. If you don't practice it, and it's not meaningful, it's sitting right here in your brain. What's the chance if I bumped into you next week and asked you when his birthday is, you could actually remember? With me, probably not that. Maybe with Lynn, maybe Lynn goes, yeah, I'm really good at remembering birthdays. I remember that I put lunch that. We're all different in terms of what our memory is like, and we're all different in terms of um, relevancy. What if your daughter is also born on May 4th? Then you go, she's born on the same day as my, as my daughter. And that makes it meaningful. It's now connected information. makes it easier to learn that. Well, what happens over time, that information that might be sitting there in the retrieval zone, there's this nasty thing that comes to play, and why we can't hold on to all of our information that we've learned. The theory is called interference. And interference says that <coughs> information is sitting in your brain. You're, you're subject to interference from two directions. One is new information is going to come in to your brain. You're going to be learning a lot today, hearing a lot of things, talking to a lot of people, and it bumps old information further back. So it kind of does this trip back until it's bumped right up into the law zone. And now, you know, the likelihood of you finding it back there is going to be fairly slim. So that's new information coming in and bumping up old information. The other problem is, is sometimes you have old information in there, but new information comes in and it contradicts. And that's confusing. It's sometimes it's hard. If you have something that you've done repetitively and you and you constantly are doing that, it's going to be really hard to change that pattern. I have an example of that. I got a new car and the back door automatically locks. I always put my briefcase and my purse on the back seat because of course I'm not going to be answering my phone when I'm driving. It's all back there, it's safe and sound. I get out of my car to get into my back seat and the door's locked. It took me three months to get into the habit now of unlocking my door consistently before I tried to open the back door. So forming a new habit can can take a while. And another example of that, and it's important I want to put a thread in there so we can understand that, is how many of you have heard the term dyslexia before? Okay, you've heard the term dyslexia. Um, how many of you, your understanding of the term dyslexia is that it has to do with a reading problem? It has to do with reversal of letters and reversal of words. How many people that sort of understanding of what it is? Okay, I'm going to tell you that that's actually incorrect. So now, you're going to have enough trouble with that because you have a pretty strong connection with that term dyslexia and that is this reversal issue. What dyslexia is, this being difficult with lexia, the written word, it's actually a language-based learning disability but it has to do with primarily the left hemisphere of the brain and having difficulty connecting, making, making an instantaneous connection with letters or groups of letters that we call phonemes, like PH and F, 
both the phoneme, the sound data, and being able to connect the sound correctly with that. So kids and adults with dyslexia have difficulty sounding out words, making that connection. As they get older, they might be able to read a lot of sight words and stuff from memory, but they get a big word that's multi-syllable that's unfamiliar and it's hard to sound that out because they have difficulty with the phonemes putting the sounds together. So now I've given you that information. I know it's going to be hard to integrate that in because we have a frequency or already have information about that. And that is going to be interference coming from the other direction. How does this relate to driver education? Automatic zone, big thing. We want to get a lot of information in the automatic zone, so it's going to happen instantaneously. A lot of reflexes, a lot of motor memory in the automatic zone. The other thing is, it is what is meaningful to you is not meaningful to you. And what's meaningful to you is not meaningful to you. And connecting and making things meaningful so that we want to do and we will employ the knowledge is very critical. And this whole process of how quickly it goes in and how quickly it comes up as a matter of retrieval is the goal, is different for different learners. So as Michelle has mentioned, um, we're, we're very different, like our brains are different. I mean, people come in all shapes, sizes, colors, everything, and our brains come in different ways too. So we have this huge learning diversity that we're dealing with. So when you're trying to get it into the automatic memory, we have to find ways to get it in for people who learn differently in different ways. Some of the factors that contribute to um, learners' uh, variability include uh, language proficiency. So, for example, English language learners, uh, or new Canadians, they're trying to study our handbooks in uh, a language that's not their mother tongue. Even for people in their own mother tongue language, if they're not well read, or they don't have a strong vocabulary, or they have some kind of reading comprehension disability, they're going to be challenged in getting the information into their head and comprehending it, and then taking the next step to utilize it. Um, that leads to literacy skills, the level of the readability of the text. So you have, you have two things. You have the readability of the text, the information they're trying to learn, and then you have the proficiency of the reader themselves. So we know in general, the general public is often recommended to have a grade six learning level, reading level, for when you have uh, general material. But what we did is we ran um, a random paragraph of one of the province's driver's handbook for the readability evaluation program, and it came out from between grade 10 and post-secondary reading level. So there was a huge discrepancy between what it should be and what it was, which creates barriers, especially for people who have reading challenges and, and learning disabilities in that area. Background knowledge, background knowledge and experience is also very important. Um, I came from Montreal as a young adult, and I just I had a driver's license, didn't have much experience. So when I came out here, um, and people were talking about traffic circles, I didn't have a clue what that was about. And stopping for pedestrians was unheard of. I mean, Montreal, everyone's out for themselves, like, you know, <laughs> they have to dodge you. So there's a few close calls, but I didn't kill anybody. But it took me a couple of months to learn to scan, to watch, or why is this car stopping in front of me to let a pedestrian cross? So, to me, even though I had driving skills in that, it totally was in my background. It was a part of my experience, so it was meaningful to me. Where my kids have grown up here, and they that was a very quick lesson when I was teaching them to drive. They knew that they were pets a lot, so they needed to watch for them. That was a connection that they already had. Um, memory and reason ability, Michelle's gone through that a little bit. Um, the, uh, the, the memory listening, and he's going to add something about the reason. Yeah. Don't remember what it is. No, we'll leave it for now. Learning styles. We all have different learning styles. We usually have a combination of them, but there's sort of three uh, basic ones. No one has like one pure. You have the visual learner who does well with pictures and with graphs and diagrams. Um, you have the auditory learner. That's a language-based learner. They do well with writing and reading and listening. And then you have the kinesthetic learner, which is more about touch, acting on the environment, doing things, their senses, that that's how they take in information better. Now the thing is, we, we all use a combination of it, but sometimes we're stronger in one area than the other. And one of, one of the comments that I want to add to that is if we think of standard education programs, which kind of learner 
does better in traditional learning environments, the auditory learner, the visual learner, or the kinesthetic learner? Absolutely the auditory learner. So the student who does better with reading, writing, and listening, which are all word and language involved, are going to do better in traditional academic or in traditional educational programs that, as you move through the grades, become typically more and more auditory. Um, and who are the individuals who typically have more difficulty in any kind of um, you know, driver education program in the, uh, at least when it comes to grading knowledge tests? And the other factor that uh, influences uh, learning variability a lot is the executive functioning. Uh, the executive functioning is the prefrontal cortex part of our brain, and it's kind of like the driver of our brain. It's the one that sort of uh, makes the decision, gets long-term planning, controls impulse, puts on the brakes before doing, making some choices, and, and things like that. So it, it plays a very important part in our, our day-to-day activity. It regulates what we start to do and what we don't do. So, this uh, executive function can be compromised in a couple of ways. Michelle mentioned the working memory and having pieces of information in there. If your working memory is trying to juggle those pieces of information, your executive functioning, which is higher skill kind of thinking, and your working memory is usually the lower skill level of um, variabilities, then there's not much left for the higher level of thinking. That. It can also be compromised due to just neurology, like brains, um, kids who have ADHD. They have done the, the imaging of the brain and their frontal lobe is underdeveloped. They're functioning at about three to four years behind their peers in the development of their frontal lobes. Another thing that we do know is that it takes the brain up to 25, even up to 30 years of age before it's fully developed and functioning at the highest level it can be. We used to think it was 18, but now the studies have shown that it takes even longer. So when we were talking earlier about all the accidents between like 16 and 25, that makes sense because they have to develop their executive functioning to the vulnerability of making those decisions. So for example, a kid who has ADHD who's not got a well-developed frontal lobe and executive functioning, they can do the, um, they know the stuff, they can reason it out. It's not that they don't have the skills and they don't have the knowledge but they can't execute it, they can't use it. Because if you act before you think, it doesn't usually work out very well. And that's part of what executive functioning is about, is of making those decisions and that impulse control. So that's why we have a lot of usually kids with speeding tickets or hopefully just minor accidents in the first couple of years of driving. Um, so one of the, the catchphrases that I like to use when we're talking about executive functioning it's not about uh, what you know, but using what you know. And, um, and it certainly is a difficult thing. We know that we can develop further along, sometimes delaying uh, people into the world of driving while they're developing their executive functioning can be very, uh, very beneficial as well. The other thing that's important if we're thinking about working memory then, looking at that between five and nine, on average seven pieces per adult, is when you are a new driver and you're still getting comfortable with you know, which is the gas and which is the brake and how do you turn on the signal lights and where are the window wipers and how do you turn the volume up and down, um, as well as all of the other sort of basics there, then you do not have much of your working memory capacity left to deal with that higher level thinking. And that's a huge issue. It's a huge issue with distractibility as well. If you're using 60 year pieces of uh, working memory to do something else, it doesn't matter. You don't have enough to utilize to take in all the information. So really, working memory test because it is a huge issue in terms of drivers' uh, driving capability as well as learning. Yeah, it's like um, you're so busy looking at trees, you don't see the forest because you're looking at an individual thing close by and you don't see the pen that's about to cross and the cars are starting to slow up in front of you. So um, if the more we have in the automatic memory, then you're free to notice those fatal potential hazards that are coming up. So, as we said, like one, one size fits all approach to driving education is not good because we have such a diverse range of learners in the world. It's, and so, most curriculum are targeting towards the imaginary average <coughs> learner and they're missing the people in the margins, which is a huge amount of the population. Um, it's like having um, 
for the driver's car seat. You know, when we get in, we also adjust the car seat. When we get in to fit our legs and our height and tilt it just right in them. It's kind of like the way the curriculum that we developed in the past is that you have a driver's car seat that would to move, it would just be set at one thing. So regardless of whether you're six foot four and then your knees would be up to your chin when you drive, or four foot eleven, you can't reach the pedals or see over the dashboard, the, you'd still be expected to drive quite well like anyone else because there'd be no adjustment. It would just be one size fits all, and that's what they would expect you to go with. And that's what we're trying to look at is of changing that and trying to have something that's flexible that would fit everyone, which they've done with the cars, right? Now with the seat, you can pretty much toilet the around. It's the bane of my existence because when my husband gets in my car or my son, I get in there and it's like tilted in the wrong direction and the back is the wrong way and, it's, and I have to go and try and find that, uh, that, that place again. But the brain is like that as well. Right. So right now, um, the problem with this is you have to be really, uh, for the devoted of the young folk, okay, that's not uh, that was me and my uh, that sensitivity, is the approach that we take often within the education system and in, in broader areas, and I work within um, one of the jobs that, that I had for 10 years as the academic strategist at uh, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. So I worked with students from 200 different programs helping them again to pass their, their, their tests and, and learn the knowledge that they need to learn. And we tend to uh, deal within these systems that with an accommodation model. And it, it, it has some real effectiveness. Uh, but what accommodation and, and accommodations right now that are happening, we know, within the uh, world of driving is providing access to the driver's handbook and tests in several languages. I mean, we think that's a really great thing. It's, it's, it's terrific to do that. There may be how many languages do we do that, how many different languages do we write the manual in, and how many languages do we test in. I'm not going there. Um, but, you know, it's a huge uh, question, I would say. Creating audio versions of handbooks and tests, allowing individuals to take the test with an audio version can be very beneficial. Um, allowing oral examinations on knowledge tests is another way of looking at it. Adaptive driver training program, I know in Alberta, the Alberta Motor Association is working with the Canadian Paraplegic Association to look at driver education and how do we have driver training for those individuals who have uh, physical disabilities. So it's not that things aren't already being done, they are being done, but it tends to be more often perhaps on an accommodation model. So universal design for learning is a little bit different. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, universal um, UDL, it's an approach to curriculum design. So it's an approach, it's a way of looking at things that looks at um, a framework that reduces the barriers. Because right now, by our design of our curriculum, in lots of areas, we do create barriers. And these barriers, when they're reduced then, um, allow us to optimize the levels of challenge because there are people that perhaps can do things a little bit faster and it's easier for them. And it also allows for support for those individuals who can learn the information but may need to do it in a different way. Um, it focuses on meeting the needs of learners from the start. Accommodations are after the fact. The person has a problem and now we're going to go in and we're going to try and find a solution to that. This is designed from the beginning. And what it's going to allow you to do, and I'm going to show you a framework, is it allows you to look at your existing curriculum and say, well, what barriers might there be already in our curriculum, and what might we be able to do then in order to reduce the barriers? I'm not sure that we can eliminate them, but we can certainly reduce them. And uh, the website that we have on here, um, CAST, which is Center for Applied Special Technology. I can never remember what the acronym uh, means. Um, is a, an amazing website that you can look at that has so much information. If you're looking at redesigning any aspect of your curriculum, you must go uh, to CAST for the talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so as Michelle mentioned, UDL is about meeting the needs of all learners, all different kinds of learners and that. So, what, what this means is it's done at the start rather than after the students are struggling and failing. 
So it's also a more effective, efficient, and cheaper way to do things because when you think of, uh, let's say, a university student that has a reading comprehension uh, challenge, to hire someone to read the exam to them is very costly and labor intensive. Instead of perhaps developing a program that's allowed the student to do exams on the computer, where they can push a button and all students can choose whether to have it auditory as well as visual, which helps everybody because the more modalities they can use, the better you understand it. So we're sort of pushing for, for that kind of variability. Um, actually, UDL emerged from architectural design uh, for buildings because we were trying to look at how do we make the buildings more accessible. So the, that included things like ramps for people with disabilities, the wheelchair and that, and, and they extended that to sidewalks and moving around so they could come up. What they started to notice was that other people were using it too, like the cyclists were using it, the long term strollers were using it, people who came to walkers or arthritis who could take the stairs were using ramps, and so they were seeing that it had a more universal application than just for what they originally had intended for. So what we're looking for in education is building all those ramps in our curriculum so that everyone can use it. And this next uh, slide, I think, really demonstrates what we're sort of talking That's about. That's a little bit too, that's yeah. a pretty small print at the back of the room. Okay. Could, could you please shovel the ramp the boy in your wheelchair says? And the guy shoveling says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And the boy in the wheelchair mentions, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So clearing a path for people with special needs clears the path for everyone. Now we have a lot of evidence-based research showing fantastic strategies for kids who do have need extra help for the kids in the margins, but we're using it after the fact, we separate them, we change the standards and demands of them, instead of incorporating them in right from the beginning so everyone can have access to these strategies which are helpful for anyone trying to learn new things. Yeah, sadly within the educational system, often to get the support that you need, you have to be identified as a person with a disability, which means you have to go through a very costly process of getting assessed, and and, uh, and sometimes you can't get assessed because that's just too costly, so we don't do that. And if you don't get assessed, then you might not get the um, assistance that you need. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So most education programs are going through a process of change, of, of not having um, tools um, handed out or assistance handed out, but really providing an array and then allowing people to utilize that. I know when my son was in high school, he's not a big reader. He can read perfectly fine. But what he did is when he had to read a novel, he would just download an MP3 version of it and he would listen to it as he read because he preferred that not because he had a disability. He liked it that better that way and he got access to the information. Who says he had to actually read the words? And that was very helpful. Universal design is proactive and inclusive rather than reactive and on an individual basis, so that's kind of different. So there are three principles of universal design for learning that we're going to be going through. And it's really, uh, I love it because it's simple, it's straightforward, and it makes sense. So principle number one is we provide multiple means of representation, or I like to say presentation. How we're providing the information, we do it in a variety of ways. Excellent. Principle two, provide multiple means of action and expression. How people will demonstrate their knowledge doesn't have to be done in a single way as well. And we need to look at that and say, what, to, what can we do? Principle number three is providing multiple means of engagement. Having students engaged in what they learn really matters because if they're not engaged, principle one and two don't matter. We'll talk more about that then. Okay, so the principle one, not only the ways of letting uh, Sorry, wait. Okay. You went through that kind of thing. You know what, we're going to come up to it again. Wait, 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 wait. I need to know what they are before you. Are you a different learner? Yes. You need that structure? I will allow you to do that. Thank you very much. No problem. You can go now. Oh, as simple as that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, being entirely on the ball, you would have to hand out all of that. Yes. You would have to uh, do that. It would be a really, uh, if we were really on top. If we were really on top. Okay, so principle one, providing multiple needs of presentation. So for example, we didn't have this PowerPoint here for you, we were just talking at you for about an hour, an hour and a half. Many of you would get some of it, but a lot of you would miss, you know, a lot if you didn't have this to support it. And it would be on top of things and giving you a handout that would be an additional support for your learning for, for later on for memory and that. 
So it is important to find multiple ways. Fortunately, we live in an age of high technology, so there's lots of avenues we can use. Um, we, we do all the different ways, so we have to learn, sorry, in different ways, so we have to find different ways to present that information. And we do have the technology. Okay. So um, we're not recommending you use it all at once, like my son likes to do, but basically you can see he's got his, his headphone, he talks to his friends, his iPad, he's got his computer, his, um, his game thing that he interacts with, and the traditional learner's book that to tell you the truth, he didn't learn his work license from that book. <laughs> he did it other ways than that. The thing is to remember though that universal design and learning is not synonymous with technology. Technology can be very helpful and very assistive in many ways when used properly, but it is also changing all the time and very quickly, which can create more obstacles and barriers for some learners overwhelming them or having something else that they have to learn. So newer does not always mean better. Principle number two, that providing multiple means of action and expression, as I mentioned, is to help with learning. And we know that then if you have, if you learn to get information in in one way, the retrieval process is going to be a little bit different. Um, some people are very good at demonstrating their knowledge, for example, on a multiple choice test. Yes. It's one way to do that. Um, well, it's actually my youngest daughter. I always remember grade 11 biology, um, she would take in bio 20. She had studied for it and she voted and it was part multiple choice and part written. And she came back and she just barely got over 50% on the multiple choice and she got over 80% on the written part. And this was the exact same exam, the same material. For her, she has a learning disability. Multiple choices are deadly for her. It's not the way to show her, her knowledge and expressing it. So that was challenging. To me, it was very clear how you need different methods to show what you know. And we're just going to show you a little bit of an example of that. So hopefully my technology here is going to work. Next. <laughs> Application. I'm actually more of a theorist. <laughs> The application in your hand, give it to her. Oh. Take this to the testing area. Put your name at the top, sign the bottom, ask the question, bring it back. Next. Wait, excuse me, but I have some concerns about these questions. <laughs> Look at that sign up there. Yes? Does it say, I give a damn? <laughs> no. That's because I don't. <laughs> Look, see, this first question makes no sense. Look, how many car lengths should you leave in front of you when driving? There's no possible way to answer that. A car length is not a standardized unit of measure. Look at the sign. Yeah. Sheldon, it's C. Just put down C. I don't need your help, Penny. Listen to that little girl, honey. Put C. Next. No, no, wait. No, hang on. Look at this next question. Sheldon, why are you arguing with the DMV? How else are they going to learn? <laughs> Look, question two. When are roadways most slippery? Now, okay, there are three answers, none of which are correct. The correct answer is when covered by a film of liquid sufficient to reduce the coefficient of static friction between the tire and the road to essentially zero, but not so deep as to introduce a new source of friction. <laughs> Here's your learner's permit. Go away. <laughs> But I'm not done. I, I have many additional concerns about these questions. Don't make me climb over this counter. All right, come on. <laughs> Next. Aced it. Is that they 
know the information, they're very good at the hands-on learning, but have real difficulty with that, um, the paper and pencil writing. But also, once they've even mastered that, they have to go and take these exams that sometimes they can't even figure out what the question is asking them. And it becomes a reading comprehension test, not a knowledge test. And I think even within, in some places, and I'm sure it varies from province to province, some of the knowledge test questions are more sometimes about the reading comprehension than they might be about the information. And uh, something to look at in terms of uh, looking at our demonstration of that knowledge as well. Yeah, I don't know what happened. We seem to have uh, lost principal. Oh, there it is. Okay. I think it's. Oh, you know what? We must have done something in other time. So short. So principal three provide multiple means of engagement the why of learning. So that's very important. We find to use the knowledge you have. It's great to have the knowledge, but if you don't use it, that's not going to do you any good. So you need to kind of have motivation. There's many factors that influence whether the students are going to be engaged and motivated. For example, uh, it can be influenced by the knology. Again, taking the ADHD um, child who, for ADHD kids, to sustain uh, their interest and their motivation, their effort is very difficult unless it's highly salient or highly relevant or highly interesting to them. So otherwise, you and I, it might be sort of not the most interesting subject, but we can self-regulate and keep our, uh, ourselves pretty much on task for ADHD kids. It, it's not that they won't, they just can't. It doesn't hook them in. So you have to find ways to engage them or to design the curriculum in such a way that it fits the way they work, like smaller pieces and getting breaks and getting around them, etc. Our culture can have an impact on engagement motivation. In Edmonton, a lot of kids like to get their license at 16, but the question it isn't like as soon as you're 16, they're out the door. How, how many people are in urban areas then? Urban areas. Now, do you find that true? Is the kids in the city are maybe a little less apt to get their license right away? Because more in the northern Alberta, the smaller communities where they don't have mass transit or public transportation, seems like it's more remote, it's further to get to their friends and that. They're right there at 16. It, it's very important. The culture is to get your license right away because it's freedom and it's, uh, it's mobility. And so, even within the same province, we see different health culture and attitude for uh, influence, engagement, and motivation. Personal, personal relevance. If someone's job depends on getting their license, they're going to be a lot more motivated and engaged to get that license if they know that I'm kind of for this job and I've got this job coming up. So there's lots of factors that go, go into it. There's subjectivity, background knowledge, as we talked about, and many other factors. Okay, so applying that to drugs application, it's very important to make it meaningful to them. Uh, to them. And it's going to be different for everybody. Just because they're different learners, what we, is meaningful, what makes it meaningful to them is going to be different too. So again, we we'll have to have all these multiple approaches to try to reach engage. For example, like you might have something very novel and just spontaneous um, sort of activity in the classroom, which some kids would love and just grab onto and really learn a lot from. Other kids are a little more frightened and sort of make them kind of go back and say, we'd rather have something more structured and predictable. So again, it depends on the individual. Um, social media, talk about social media being a really important element in terms of driving for education of young drivers because that is a way of getting to them in a relevant and meaningful way. Yes. And is that, was there a question? Okay, so this clip I found just a couple of days before coming here and I thought it was really sort of relevant. It, uh, it was where um, in Brussels they sort of found a, a program that they used to try to motivate young drivers not to text or drive at the same time. So we just show you what they came up with.
itself is kind of humorous and engaging, but to actually have those people who actually did that um, experiment, I don't think will ever use their cell phone while driving. So it was a very kinesthetic way of learning and uh, sort of in all the senses there. So that, that's sort of a key factor. Motivating new drivers to use their knowledge of skills is the key to safe driving. Now, the study by Mayhew and Simpson, that's what they, they've done a broad sort of uh, literature search of all the driver education, well, not all, but many driver education courses. And what they found was it wasn't really so much getting the skills and knowledge in at certain times, it was getting to, to motivate to use it. They knew the behavior, but they weren't almost motivated to use what they knew. So that's really important. And when you make it meaningful and it resonates with people, having them engaged in it, then they're more likely to use what they learn and follow those behaviors. So how do you take this information then? How does UDL help with this? So CAST, that organization we were talking about, developed universal design for learning guidelines. And that is available. We'll have a copy at our at our booth for you to have a look at. You can also go to the CAST organization. And if you're looking at developing or evaluating curriculum, you need to be looking through this information. I'm going to show you some of the kinds of information that's contained and how you might be able to utilize that. So here's an example. Um, This isn't a website, so I don't have to worry. It should take us into it. So what we have done, we've taken from the CAST UDL guidelines, and they created an evaluation procedure that you can go through. It breaks down the three principles. You can see under here, we've got principle one, and then there's a whole bunch of subsections, and then principle two and subsections, and principle three and subsections, and divided it up so that you can look at all the different aspects. And then you can evaluate different things if you're looking, for example, at the beginner's or learner's license handbook, and to see, well, what are some ways that you could modify it, improve it, enhance it in order to address some of the issues in that UDL? And it could be any aspect of the curriculum, including driver testing or the um, driver training program. So that's what that, um, that is. We're just going to look at a, a section of it. That is under um, principle number one, providing options for perception. But what I want to show you here, we'll go through in a little bit more depth. This is again under um, providing options for perception, and this is point number two, which is providing options for language, mathematical expression, and symbols. So 2.1 says clarify vocabulary and symbols. And as Dex had mentioned before, is that there can be a lot of difficult terminology in that driver's handbook if we're looking at driver's handbook. So defining novel or difficult terms, providing hyperlinks if you're on your online version to glossaries would be one way that you could address some of those issues. Providing a legend for symbols, um, for putting symbols in there. I know that uh, Dex and I were confused about a couple of symbols once and thinking, well, what is that even pertaining to? And, and it didn't have any kind of glossary guideline in it. Clarifying syntax and structure. How many people know what syntax means? Okay, one or two. Well, here's an example of what you can do then, is we have syntax means the study of rules that govern the way words combine and form phrases, clauses, and sentences. I saw the analysis where it was You did. Did you, did you want to explain that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving you an example of syntax. Oh, okay. There. Oh, in terms of, yes, yes. Was she wearing the pajamas or was the elephant wearing the pajamas? I don't know. And how, with what exactly? Yeah. So how we phrase things, and what happens is that typically the longer your sentences get, and the more multi-syllable words that you have, the more difficult it is is to read that information. So um, clarifying syntax, and how can you do that? Well, part of it is uh, putting things into bullet form. One of the things that I teach, and even at the, the level of um, uh, people doing their postdoctoral work is how do you look at information and break it down to its key components? And you look for words like and and but and therefore, and it shows you the relationship. And then we can change that and put it into more of a simple format, and it makes it clarifies the relationship between the ideas. Comparison charts. This is what I call a matrix, and a matrix can be a wonderful way to combine information when we have categories that we can compare. And sometimes we do that, 
and sometimes we don't do that. There's been great ones that Dex and I have seen in some of the books that we're looking at. Uh, support for the decoding of text. So controlling for reading level. Dex has already talked about that. And what I've done here is, um, let's see if it goes to that. There. Um, this website, which is, you can just type into your browser, readabilityformulas.com. If you're curious to know what your information is, that you can go in and use the online readability calculator. Some of the most common ones are the space formula, formula the prize readability index, and you can look at it. What's kind of weird about them though is you can click it in there and depending on the readability formula will come up with quite a variety. But you do it using several readability formulas and you do it with several components of the text and it gives you an idea of what the readability level. Now a lot of them are going to come up as grade 10 level. No, okay. That's pretty appropriate. Who's getting their voter's license if we're talking about voter's license? Often kids who are in grade 10. But how many of those kids are reading at the grade 10 level? Well, some of them are and some of them aren't. And many other people coming in for different reasons might have, um, have literacy issues as well. So promoting understanding across languages. So controlling for vocabulary because of people who might not have that. They might have conversational English or French or whatever language you're dealing with, but they don't have the vocabulary at the level that we're talking about. Embedding non-linguistic supports for vocabulary, more descriptors, more visual kind of representations. And illustrating through multimedia. Of course, we have the ability to do that. And I think the coolest thing is going to be when people put their, their handbook online with all sorts of interactive components links to uh, YouTube videos, links to animated illustrations, interactive graphics, and that kind of thing that can really show what's going on rather than just reading it in a standard kind of format. Okay, so that's what so just to summarize, I mean, um, the universal design for learning is a framework that helps drivers that have access to the information, the ability to express it, and the motivation and engagement so that they will express it. UDL is not so much about just the information. What they want to do is create what we call expert learners. And expert learners, they're goal-directed, strategic, they're knowledgeable, and they're motivated to learn more. And so when you have a UDL approach, because it's engaging, it's interesting, it appeals to their learning style, they're going to be excited about learning and they're going to be motivated to learn more about it because they're succeeding. So basically what we're saying, if the access available to learning is limited, the learning will be limited. And that's the bottom line for that. Next clip sort of um, illustrates that a little bit. Everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Albert Einstein. We know that there's lots of aspects of the driver education program that is utilizing these principles in a, in a major way. And it's fantastic. What we know is that there's aspects that are not utilizing them at all, and it could be enhanced. And um, as time goes on, I think the more people we're going to have, the more understanding of this and that and that, and understand that it's, it's not about, and we've had concerns from people say, are there people that should not be driving, that don't have the ability to be driving? And absolutely, that would be true. But we know that there's a lot of people that are very confident, or have the ability to be very confident, and if we just train them in a way, um, or educated them in a way, the likelihood that they're going to be more skilled and safer drivers is going to be, um, is going to be greater. So, on that note,